Welcome everyone to the sixth free online space education summit. Uh, as always, we will kick off this morning with a astronaut panel with three distinguished guests. Uh, and then we've got a number of speakers here uh, sharing throughout the day, 16 breakout sessions before our fireside chat this afternoon uh, with Frank White, uh, author of The Overview Effect, and 16-year-old Felix Gatfield, uh, YouTuber from the UK. So it's going to be really fun uh, to hear those two share their thoughts, uh, both being uh, people who have interviewed many, many astronauts themselves um, and, and having six decades between their, their birth dates. Uh, I hope you guys will come back and listen to the two of them this afternoon too. Uh, but for this morning, we're going to go ahead and uh, kick off. I want to uh, briefly introduce the idea of the overview effect because this is uh, very much inspired our panel. And if you, if you aren't familiar with it, I want to at least put that out there. But uh, Frank White, who will be with us during the uh, fireside chat this afternoon, uh, introduced this idea in his book in 1987 after interviewing dozens of astronauts and people who had been to space uh, and realizing that many of them, not all, many of them experience a cognitive shift where they, they look down at the planet and they don't see borders and they don't see tribes uh, and they see that we're all in this together in a relatively uh, fragile uh, spaceship Earth hurtling through uh, the blackness of space. And they tend to come back uh, more committed to, say, the environment and to diplomacy uh, and to uh, working together uh, toward a better future. So this has very much inspired our work here, and I want to recognize the other uh, organizers in particular, uh, Gitta Kogorthy, who we just heard briefly and has uh, just made it over from class. Uh, is a, a student at Columbia University. You may know her from her Ignited Thinkers uh, interview sessions. Um, we're really excited to have her on the planning team, and she's brought together a whole uh, young professionals-focused strand and a number of our speakers, so thanks, Gitika. Uh, and then Ron Rossano, uh, Virgin Galactic astronaut and uh, and longtime, um, you know, contributor to their space chats uh, community. Ron's been involved with space education uh, since uh, the the 90s, if I got that right, Ron, with the uh, yeah, Astronomy right. Society of the Pacific. Do I have that right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right around the mid '90s, doing uh, uh, lessons in classrooms related to space and astronomy. So super stoked to be working with Ron again. Um, and Ron himself has been to space on Virgin Galactic. So we have we have four astronauts on this panel. Uh, thanks, Ron, for for being a part of it. Uh, and Dr. Anahita Nazami, who's, I believe, not with us just yet today, but uh, she's been a big part of organizing this event over several years. She's a practicing psychologist in the UK uh, and the founder of Earthscape VR. So um, it's been great to work with her on this event. Uh, and then myself, uh, all of my work now is focused on space education. I am a uh, one-time uh, astronautical engineering student, former high school English teacher, <laughs> career education technologist, uh, now focused entirely on space education uh, and my company, Aries Learning, which is the Academy for the Relentless Exploration of Space. So super stoked to be working on this uh, project as well. Uh, I've invited everyone to share in the uh, chat uh, your tra trajectory, what brings you today to this uh, space education event in 2024, uh, and definitely be thinking about what questions you would ask an astronaut, because we have our panel coming right up. Um, which brings us to you and your participation. Please do participate in the text chat. Uh, you can always use the raise hand uh, feature, especially in a large group like this, if you have something to contribute, um, or in smaller groups, just speak up. Uh, and you can certainly share a screen when invited at this point. We've got uh, everybody permission to do that for all the speakers and everything for the later sessions. Um, but of course, do be considerate. If you need any help, uh, reach out to Ron or myself uh, or just simply use the help feature uh, in Zoom and, uh, and a message will get to Ron straight away. All right. If there are no other questions, we're going to dive right in. So I want to introduce uh, today's astronaut panel. Uh, first, we have a veteran NASA astronaut, Dr. Katie Coleman, a veteran of two uh, space shuttle missions. She has, if I've got it right, something like 159 days in space and uh, is a, a veteran of the space station as well on Expedition 26 and 27. Um, I'm super excited because uh, she has a new book out, Sharing Space. Um, and oh, an astronaut's guide to mission wonder and making change. Uh, and I love some of her thoughts. There it is. Yes. 
uh, this this influenced even the uh, the course that I run for teachers. I brought a lot of the ideas from that book uh, right into the skill sets and mindsets uh, segment, Katie. So I can't wait to talk to you about operational mindset today. <laughs> um, and next we have uh, Ken Hess. And Ken is a uh, engineer and entrepreneur who uh, helped shape the uh, family history industry uh, back in the 90s. And Ken, uh, earlier this year, flew on the New Shepard uh, NS25 flight uh, with Blue Origin. Um, so along with all of us, I know Ken was watching the flight this morning with uh, Emily and crew that just touched down. So exciting times. What a, what a world that we live in. And we can all connect like this on a day like that. Um, we have that kind of access and this that kind of travel to space right now. Um, Ken is also the founder of Science Buddies, uh, which is a uh, K-12 STEM education nonprofit with uh, a quarter billion users. So hopefully Ken will share a little bit of uh, of that story today. And then finally, we have uh, Chris Huey, or Chewy, as his uh, co-workers and friends know him, uh, a <clears throat> Virgin Galactic uh, employee who has also been up on the Virgin Galactic VSS Unity ship uh, on the Unity 25 flight. Uh, and I noticed in your email signature, Chris, that you're working on the Delta ship now. So that's uh, that's really exciting. And hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, he's also a uh, co-founder of Virgin Galactic's uh, Black Leadership in Aerospace Scholarship and Training, or BLAST, uh, program uh, with a focus on uh, mentoring college students and increasing the number of uh, Black leaders in, air in the aerospace industry. So we're excited to have Chris here today. Everybody here has got some connection uh, with STEM uh, education and mentorship of students. So um, really fantastic to have uh, these folks all together uh, on this panel and to be able to ask them a few questions. And I think for the, the sake of the recording, Ron, I'm going to stop sharing and we should uh, the panel pinned here. And the uh, first question I want to throw out to folks, um, and we can go in any order, but I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, what is the trajectory that brought you here uh, and that brought you to being an astronaut? Uh, and I love the sort of a bonus question uh, to extend the metaphor a little bit, but is there anybody who maybe gave you a uh, a gravity assist along the way, a mentor, or an educator, or something like that is a great place to start uh, Start this morning. So I will uh, stop sharing the slides and it would be great. Um, Katie, if I can put you on the on the spot, maybe we can start with you and then we'll, we'll hear from Ken and Chris. Well, it used to be with, um, I'd be talking with another um, astronaut from the NASA astronaut corps. It would happen often that somebody would ask that question and if they started off, they'd go, well, like every, you know, six-year-old boy, I wanted to be an astronaut. And pretty much everything in that sentence just doesn't apply to me, right? <laughs> and um, and I really, it never, it's not something that I thought about doing until I was, uh, until I was a senior in college and Sally Ride, first American woman astronaut, came to, I went to MIT at the time, came there and told her story just before she flew. And it's not that I thought, well, if she can do that, I can do that. It was more, I thought, well, she really, I, we seem to have these things in common, you know, this sort of, just, you know, sort of looks and feels like me. And, and we both seem to feel like being the best you can be at whatever you're studying is important and having a, you know, a passion for your mission. Um, and, and at the same time, wanting some adventure. So that made all the difference for me. Um, and, and I just think that we still, um, out in the world, it's still so necessary, not for everyone, but for many that, somebody that they see somebody that looks and I, when I say looks I don't mean actually sort of visually but somebody feels like them um, but I don't think that would have been possible without I, I'm somebody that likes encouragement I do well with encouragement um, and uh, and so a high school chemistry teacher that was just sure that chemistry was the most best thing in the whole world and it was for me and and so I, you know different teachers along the way including a drama teacher that um, just said, you know, Katie, if you can play the flute in this little trio or whatever that we're doing for the dinner theater, you could be up on sp stage being you, even if you can't sing. And and realizing that maybe I could actually share in that way. And somebody that just is, looks at you and is sure you can do it, that made all the difference for me. Thanks. Oh, that's awesome. And I, I know from reading your book, you do pretty well with people telling you no. Too. <laughs> well, I like to use that sort of part. To, it makes me mad. And then, you know, and that seems to help fill in the gaps that I'm not so good at filling in. Awesome. Well, thanks for, for kicking us off. Maybe we can, we can go over to Ken next. Sure. Uh, you know, I grew up during the space race. I was uh, in elementary school when the first uh, 
first astronauts flew to space and followed it intently. I, my dad was an engineer. I was a future engineer at the time. And I just, I just ate it up. I remember being out in the front yard watching the echo satellite go across the sky. It was a hundred foot balloon, one of the first communication satellites where they just beamed the radio signal off the balloon and back down to earth. Uh, a concept that didn't last too long, but uh, it was pretty special to watch that up in the sky. And, um, you know, I ended up not pursuing it as a college major, got into software. But, um, you know, as the X Prize happened in the early 2000s, and um, uh, it became possible to go to space, uh, you know, I... I had to do it. I um, waited a few years. I, my, my father passed away in 2013, and that's when I decided, you know, what am I waiting for? Signed up for Virgin Galactic and have been in the queue since then. When uh, Blue Origin started offering uh, seats, I decided that was a good way to jump the line and uh, uh, and flew this past, uh, past May. But uh, so there was a lot of least regrets thinking, I guess, is the best way to say it. Having the opportunity, the means, and the interest, how could I not do it? So uh, so I did. Love it. What, what was the phrase you just used, Ken? The opportunity thinking? Oh. Uh, well, least regrets thinking. Least regrets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having the opportunity, the means, and the interest, how could I look back and say I didn't do it? You know, that's that was just unthinkable. Least regrets thinking. I, I got to think through that because that sounds like something I, <laughs> I I'd like to adopt. Uh, well, let's let's kick it over to uh, Chewy then. What's the trajectory that uh, that brought you to space with Virgin Galactic? Yeah, it was uh, most unexpected and wasn't part of the plan. You know, looking back at my career, I couldn't have planned almost any of the things that I ended up doing in my career. Um, like I grew up in Central Florida, so I kind of grew up watching the space shuttle launch. Um, kind of on a regular basis, you know, you, you're at recess at school and you look up and you see the shuttle launching up at the Cape. Um, and then, you know, you're sleeping in the middle of the night and you hear the sonic boom and the shuttle came, came back. So I probably heard Katie coming back from space in the middle of the night one day um, if she landed at uh, the Cape one time. But, you know, my story kind of starts with um, uh, my parents. So my mom immigrated from Jamaica to the United States when she was 17. And, um, you know, I'll skip all the, the hairy details, but she raised my sister and I as a single mom. And, um, and so I spent a lot of time, like my sister's about six years older than me. And so while we were close in age, once she became a teenager and I was still a kid, we were basically like polar opposite people. And so, um, while my mom was working, I basically spent a lot of time watching the discovery channel, a lot of time playing with my Legos, a lot of time watching star Trek. Um, then I'd fly back and forth to see my dad, uh, in New York. And so I um, had a lot of exposure to like airplanes and I was always like the unaccompanied minor anytime I flew. Um, <clears throat> and so every time I flew, I got my little Delta wings, um, got to meet the pilot, got to see the cockpit, that type of stuff. Uh, all the flight attendants were always super nice to me because they were essentially my, my grown up for the next couple of hours. Um, so I think that all those things kind of combined together inspired me to uh, want to be part of aviation. So, you know, I wanted to be an inventor, I wanted to be a garbage man. I still think being driving a garbage truck would be sweet. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to be a pilot, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And my mom basically told me, you know, you're not joining the military. And I was like, okay. Um, so then I decided uh, aerospace engineering was gonna be uh, the best option for me to kind of scratch that itch and still be able to um, find my way in, in the space industry, in aerospace. And specifically, I was obsessed with helicopters. And so, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of documentaries about the Sikorsky RAH-66, the st first stealth helicopter. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And so I was like, I gotta get into this. And so I got my bachelor of science in aerospace engineering from University of Maryland. And um, I didn't even realize that Maryland is one of the three schools in the United States that has a rotorcraft center of excellence. So I kind of lucked out there um, and did some undergraduate research um, in the rotorcraft center. And then I interned at a couple companies um, Oh, at Sikorsky Aircraft, uh, which was cool. The company that actually inspired me to join the aerospace industry, I got to intern there in the aerodynamics team and actually see some of the design engineering of the helicopter. That was my original inspiration. Um, but anyways, then I got a job at Bell Helicopter in Texas after graduation. 
And, um, and I thought that was going to be it. I thought like my dream was to become a helicopter engineer. And then I achieved that dream in not as much time as I would have thought in hindsight. And I was like, okay, well, what do I do now? Um, and so one of the things I tell all my mentors, my mentees now is make sure your dreams are pretty much unattainable because uh, once you <laughs> achieve them, like, what do you do next? And so, um, <clears throat> uh, my mentor at, uh, at, uh, at Bell got laid off and I ended up becoming one of the lead engineers there. And he ended up at Virgin Galactic. And a couple of years later, he was like, uh, Chewy, you've got to come over to Virgin Galactic. And I was like, I am a helicopter engineer. I don't even know how I'm remotely qualified to work on spaceships. And um, anyways, he he won that fight and I ended up moving over to Virgin Galactic. And it turns out Newton's laws of physics are the same regardless of, of where you are. As long as you're significantly sub the speed of light, uh, F still equals MA. And so um, <clears throat> working at a, at a space company, a commercial human space flight company, I figured I would... There was a, was a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to not only create kind of a new type of vehicle of this magnitude, but also to develop a whole new industry of commercial human space flight. You know, aerospace moves notoriously slow. And so to be able to create a new product and a new industry at the same time seemed uh, pretty unique. So I jumped on the opportunity. It didn't hurt that there was going to be like a non-zero chance that maybe I would get to go to space. And uh, long story short, I was great at my job, uh, met some good people, made a great impression, and was handpicked to be one of our mission specialists, which was uh, testing out the commercial uh, experience of Virgin Galactic's rocket last year. Well, I imagine being a, a helicopter engineer working in the space industry, ingenuity must have been exciting for you. Uh, yeah. yeah. But also what you're saying about, especially with an eye on the educators and the students that are watching and will watch this, uh, the, the idea that your dreams should be nearly unattainable, I, I think, uh, is really important. There's this great quote from uh, Astro Teller, or at least I saw it in a Moonshot Thinking video several years ago, where he said your, your uh, ambitions are a glass ceiling to your achievements. It's, yeah, it's, it's really amazing you actually mentioned that quote. So another crazy story. Uh, three years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Necker Island, uh, Richard Branson's private island in the Caribbean uh, for a leadership summit <clears throat> and Astro Teller was there oh. and um, he was talking about big thinking and through a course of our of the long weekend uh, we came to the conclusion that I could be better at big thinking and and since then he's actually uh, been mentoring me so uh, it's, hey, it's a lot of coincidence awesome. that I'm learning to think bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good route to least regrets as well. <clears throat> well let's uh Ron, if uh, if you want to take the uh, the next question here, sure. You know, one of our uh, connect great connectors here is, is the the idea of the overview effect. And Frank, great to see you here. Uh, that's just that 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 type of thinking has grown so much, and will keep growing. You know, one of the great things about seeing Blue Origin launch today that uh, the count of suborbital astronauts is now over hundred. So out of 700 plus 110 or so people in space, more than 100 have flown suborbitally. And uh, the total between Galactic and Blue Origins up to about 86 now. So just a significant amount. Um, yeah, Katie and, and Ken and Chewy, did you have, do you have overview effect kind of takeaways from your flights? Uh, I know one thing Frank thought early on was, you know, gee, could you have or the effect on a suborbital flight that's so fast, uh, you know, so brief compared to, you know, being in orbit. And uh, Frank, since your video's on, uh, maybe I uh, should turn that question over to you. Well, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> well, when people said you can't possibly experience this phenomenon on a suborbital flight, you're not far enough away from the Earth, and uh, it it happens too fast. And I always love it when people think they know enough about the overview effect to tell me uh, what's going to happen. Uh, my response was, you know, we don't know a lot about suborbital flight. We've only had two people uh, in the NASA um you know, program experience it. So let's wait and see. I've always tried to take some sort of a scientific approach to this and have a hypothesis and then gather data. And my way of gathering data is to interview astronauts. So 
I said, let's wait and see. And I've now interviewed you. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I haven't interviewed Ken yet. But, um, you know, based on what I've learned, yeah, you can uh, have that experience of um, awe and wonder from a suborbital flight. And I do want to say that, um, you know, it's it's different for everyone. Uh, I've never tr I've never attempted to say every last person has the experience that I've described, but large numbers of people do. And I've got Dylan Taylor in one of the interviews I did with him stating directly, if you know, if you have a question about whether you can experience the overview effect on a suborbital flight, I'm here to tell you, you can. 100%. So, yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> kind of depends on the individual. So I'll stop there. Everything I know, I've learned from astronauts. You've got four here, including yourself. So I'll be quiet. But thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. Well, well thanks for, for being here. Yeah, well, one thought I had is that, like, you, you can't bring it up on yourself. You can't say, okay, I'm going to have the overview effect now. It's like... I think you have to be open to it and, and, and let it come in if it's, you know, if you're, if you're there. Anyway, Katie, Ken, Chewy, what are your thoughts? Was you over fit? Have you felt over the effect kind yeah. of uh, experience? Well, you know, um, my strategy for, for the flight was just to turn on my mental record button and absorb as much as I could. Uh, in a suborbital flight, well, in, in the Blue Origin suborbital flight, you're able to unstrap for about two minutes and 20 seconds, and you've got about 77 seconds above the Kármán line. Uh, so it's not a lot of time. I didn't want to be up there thinking and analyzing. Uh, anyone who knows me, you know, I did, you know, like 11 years of thinking and analyzing before I went up. But uh, during the flight, I just wanted to absorb everything I could. And um, the results of that, when I reflected afterwards, were, were uh, several. First of all, the big surprise for me was during the boost phase, it was like going up in a glass elevator. Um, I, I expected a lot more shake, rattle, and roll. And uh, it was not like that at all. Um, extremely smooth, um, like nothing I'd experienced, you know, and the difference between it and an elevator is that the acceleration just keeps going. We're all used to a burst of acceleration in an elevator or a burst of acceleration in a car, but when you're in a rocket, it lasts until you shut down the, the engine. So you're really back in your seat for a long period of time, but you're just sitting there watching out of the corner of your eye as the earth disappears in the distance. You know, I wanted to go so I could see the earth and the earth really was just as beautiful as all the pictures. Uh, but I, I didn't, you know, there was nothing surprising or transformative about that. The big surprise to me when I was in space was the sun. We're, we're so used to seeing the sun through the frame of reference of the earth, uh, you know, rising in the morning, well, like this morning here, uh, Central California coast, red sky, uh, you know, very beautiful. Uh, or I can go down to the beach at night and watch it slip below the horizon. And again, a beautiful red sky, red clouds. Even midday, you've got it up there in the middle of a bright blue sky. When you're in space and, and in a suborbital space, we're going up during the day, it sun's at about 30 degrees elevation. The sun is just there. Um, there's no frame of reference of the earth or anything close. It's sitting there in a black sky. Uh, you realize, hey, I'm looking at a, a star close up. It, it doesn't feel like the sun, the way the sun does on earth. It, it was very different. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to go up and see the earth in its natural environment. And I came away feeling I'd seen the solar system in its natural environment. That's really cool, Ken. Beautiful. Thanks. 
I don't know if folks um, realize that we don't get to talk to each other all that much. You know, even within the NASA astronaut corps, we're all, you know, we're on a crew, but then we're spread out. I mean, every once in a while, like when you get back from a flight, you'll all talk and then you sort of each talk about things in some public appearance together. But it's always this great thing to hear, especially somebody else um, that you haven't been on, you know, on stage with or answered questions with or hear what they say. And and I often think that the questions and and people like Frank who ask a, ask questions of us that we wouldn't think to ask of ourselves. It's almost the most important part of the flight. You know, that that just us alone, that's not and that's not sort of the whole experience. It's also figuring out how to tell those stories. And, and one of those is how you feel looking at the earth. And I, I actually think um, that, I mean, it's about seeing how sort of how big something is and how small we are and, and how something that just seemed impossible is possible, which I think you can see in other ways in your life. And at the same time, it's a very special experience to, to have that be the earth. And for me, the overriding um, sensation was just that, you know, I thought I'd be going to space, I'd be going somewhere else. And I didn't feel like I was like away from home. I mean, because home is like right in front of you. And and I still felt like I belonged and I was part of that and and I was connected to people that are back there. And it's that sense of connection that was the biggest thing for me. I mean, not so much my connection to the earth, but the fact that if only the people on the earth knew how connected they could be to each other, that they're just like just this far away. And we have like communication and transportation that can solve those problems. And if only people could be connected to each other, we could certainly just make more progress on so many of the challenges that we that we face and if we understood different points of view so to me it was that kind of thing but i also just love i love seeing frank with the, the picture of the moon in back of him and when i look at pictures from artemis um i mean there were pictures of the earth taken by satellites or whatever I, i've forgotten what exactly took those pictures i'm sure a lot of people on this call know but this was the first human a picture that we had of the earth taken from space and and there's something about the the very human part of that and even with the first artemis um, mission even though there weren't humans on board the fact that those cameras which i think we've gotten to feel closer to cameras kind of seeing for us um looking back and seeing the earth it's something that changes all of us you know now we have not just the view in back of frank's head but other views and the four people are going on rms2 are going to have other views and um i just think it's 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 a really important view and I, i'm glad that we're exploring it through people like frank it's awesome i see a real theme there too in terms of people on earth being connected and these views changing all of us that's thanks that's beautiful too there's a there's some thinking uh, I've seen along that and that humans are of the earth so in a sense astronauts looking back at the earth is in a way earth looking back at itself and yeah, I just thought that was a nice great concept yeah Chewie <clears throat> um you know along the same lines as, as Katie saying you know astronauts don't get to talk to other astronauts all that often. I think as we're sending more and more people, it's kind of getting statistically easier. Um, so I appreciate these types of opportunities. But the thing about the overview effect is every time I talk about it, every time I share my experience with a group of people, um, and especially one-on-one, -on -one, and you get to like deep dive specific topics with um, someone, like I learn more about it and I learn more about my experience personally. And so it's just such a, a treat to get to mutually discover that effect as you talk about it, because um, I get to see it from someone else's perspective as I tell them the story and then they reflect back on on what they feel and how they um, what they thought about it or what they heard in my perspective. And so when when I was preparing for my space launch, Virgin Galactic launches out of New Mexico in the southwest United States. It's a very brown part of the United States. Um, uh, and you can very clearly see the brownness from space. <clears throat> um, I thought it was going to be important for me to, to look down on the Earth and know what I was looking at. And so I was looking at Google Earth before when I was doing my training and I was trying to memorize mountain ranges and rivers and lakes and national parks because I wanted to be able to identify those things. You know, that's my engineering brain is like very clearly having information a priori uh, prior to the event that I'm looking at. And then I got to space and I was floating weightless looking out the window and, uh, you know, it all went out the window, like, so to speak. 
And what blew my mind is that I could see farther than I've ever been able to see before. And so here I was with my earthly perspective thinking when I got to space, I was going to be looking down on a map flat. And when you're in space, you very clearly see the curvature of the earth. And from a comparing earth to space, you can see over the horizon, you know, it's just a different horizon from space. You can't see on the other side of the sphere, um, but you can see so far. And that was actually the first thing I said. I was like, wow, you can see so far. And I think my favorite thing about my experience, similar to what Ken was saying, you just kind of like hit the record button on your brain. Um, and that overarching question, can you experience the overview effect in a short amount of time? I think, um, you know, in engineering and in science, when you have like a nonlinear experience, you have to have a, a faster record rate to, to capture all the information um, so you can start to linearize it and process. And so I think, um, you know, when your adrenaline's pumping, you just remember things in, in more clarity and the event, um, I call it um, when a matrix moment or like time felt like it slowed down. Um, and so there's so much of that, that short experience that I have uh, great clarity, but um, in space, looking at the earth, I experienced uh, like a severe amount of cognitive dissonance where I was feeling like I was two different versions of myself at the same time. Um, looking at the earth, seeing the vastness of space, like contextually, it was like crazy to see where the earth is. Um, just like Ken was saying, like you saw the sun just like in the solar system hanging out by itself. You're like, and I remember thinking to myself, holy crap, uh, we out here, y'all. It's just us. Like the earth is just there. And the nearest, the next closest thing is hundreds of thousands of miles away. And, and then everything else, everywhere else that we know about is desolate and doesn't support life that we know. And so looking down at our planet, I was like, this is it. We are, we are alone to, you know, to, for a terrible pandemic quote, we are alone together, um, you know, going from like the lockdown. But like as a planet, I felt connected to everyone on the planet um, and together in that sense. But I also felt distinctly alone as a species in that this is our home and this is something that we need to be very cognizant of and taking care of. Um, I, in, as I've talked to the overview effect over the, you know, the years since I've flown, um, I've come to the conclusion and I've told Frank about this. I think the overview effect is, is a spectrum, a sliding spectrum of like uh, an abrupt uh, discrete experience that you have. Or then there's like on the subtle side, you're like, okay, it's maybe, maybe more like a, a frog in boiling water that sneaks up on you and you have this different uh, effect. But I think it's a mindset. And there are, there are many ways to, to experience a mindset. Um, in Earlier this year, I was in Texas at the, I saw the eclipse. I was speaking there and I talked to a guy who was convinced he had experienced the overview effect. And after hearing my experience and we talked about it for maybe like 20 minutes, um, he kind of broke down into tears and was so grateful because um, I confirmed for him that he had already experienced the overview effect and he didn't need to go to space. But without having talked to anyone that's been to space, he didn't know how to compare his feelings to mine. Um, also, I spoke to a psychologist who um, who deals in psychedelics, right? And, you know, brain altering chemicals, if you will. And as I was describing my experience to, to the psychologist, they said, it sounds like you experienced like a psychedelic, you know, event where you had this cognitive shift and were able to have like this cognitive dissonance, but like experience, almost have like a conversation with yourself uh, in a very uh, clear and prescient way. And so um, I like to think of the overview effect as like, how do we get to a cultural critical mass where we haven't sent enough people, we haven't sent enough diverse, uh, a diverse representative set of people to space to really understand what it means to experience the overview effect and what it's going to be like. But I think we still have a huge body of, of work to explore as we start to increase the number of people and the different uh, diversities of people, all the way that people are diverse from each other. And it's my hope that when we send a statistically representative sample of the earth to space and then come back down and get that experience, that we cross pollinate that experience into the earth where we can all experience the overview effect without having to go to space. And it's my hope that that pollination of the overview effect with that cultural critical mass um, will start to make huge shifts in how humanity thinks about their place in the universe, their place with each other and our, our relationship with the planet. Mark, I know we oh. should go to other questions, but I just wanna say real quick that um, that really strikes a chord for me, Chewie, where you talked about how sort of big and, and just, you know, you, you saw so far and you realize just, you know, you're, it's, it's, I don't know, you're, the, the, 
you know, missions or the things that we're part of can be so much bigger than we are, you know, that view of the earth. But at the same time that it's a giant mission that's so much bigger than you are, it actually depends on you as well as a person. Like there are so few people who've been to space that everyone's speaking their mind whether it's answering a question, did you feel the overview effect, which is a certain definition, but just how you felt um, and the fact that we haven't had enough different kinds of people going, that that means every single person speaking up in their own way is so important. Um, and, and I think that really helps uh, at sort of augment the numbers that we don't have yet. So thanks very much. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, in some vein, you might, you could probably make an argument that we'll never, we won't have a a confident definition of the overview effect until we've sent everybody <laughs> because everyone has their own experience to bring to it. And uh, we're still learning what it means to be human and how we interface with our environment. And everyone comes from a different place with a different background, with a different story that's going to see things through their own lens. And down here on the ground as well, as you, as you mentioned, I think that's important, especially for some of the folks, uh, somebody was saying, you know, I'm jumping from, you know, how many thousand feet and I saw some of the chat going by, but I do think that you can have these, changing kinds of experiences, you know, almost anywhere. It's about a mindset, really. Okay, well, quit interrupting, Mark. Do you want to do more questions? Oh, no worries. It's, it, you guys have actually sort of very, very smoothly transitioned right into the question I have to ask, which is uh, how might we best prepare uh, students or the next generation for humanity's future in space? So you guys have had this uh, this experience. We It sounds like, uh, you know, we, sh we need to be increasing the sample size any Anyway, of, of folks who do and folks who want to get involved. Um, but how might we better prepare students for, for humanity's future in space? And I'll just leave it open-ended. And then we'll go to the uh, participants because we've already had some great, great questions in chat. Okay. It's a hard question. I'll just give you one little piece. I mean, I, I, I think there's some, there's something really compelling. We all know this. I mean, there's something really compelling about space. And it makes kids study and learn and decide to look at something. Um, and, and I think everybody on this screen, you know, if you're here, you've thought about that or you're part of actually, um, you know, my, I worked for the chief technologist for a little while um, at head headquarters, a guy named David Miller. And he's the one that started that spheres experiment where they had these sort of soccer ball sized spheres up in space that were part of a very complicated an, an important rendezvous experiment about spacecraft, but he also made it this education thing. And it started because he, he watched Star Wars and he looked at his graduate students and he goes, when, when uh, Luke would start and was learning how to use the, the lightsaber, he goes, I want six of those and I want them on the space station, not the lightsaber, but the spears. And that's really the origin of this very cool for many years contest where kids could beam up software that then they could figure out who had the best you know, score doing this. and. And, um, and so here, you know, um, and so I worked for this guy who, you know, comes from this kind of magical place in his head. And, uh, and, and he goes, you know, Katie, I know that like, you know, you're an astronaut and you're really great, but one of the reasons I want to have you here is I want you to be like the Trojan horse. You know, people are going to want to talk to you. I want to bring you to things. I want them to want to talk to you. And then basically I want you to then tell them what we do that is important that you're part of here. You know, and if I just, if I say I'm David Miller, I want to tell them they're not, they're not really going to care. But if you start the conversation, we'll all be able to participate. And, and so I think thinking about that kind of, um, you know, what is the, the allure of space and how can we use it to help kids understand uh, that they could really be whatever they want to be as well. Um, I think the way, one of the ways to start that is um, when they say, you know, well, I'm an artist or I'm a this or I'm a that, and I'll bet you I can't be an astronaut. And to say, well, not yet, you know, or, or I mean, and actually we don't, we shouldn't even say that anymore because look who can go on Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. And I know it's not just billionaires. And so, um, so anyways, I think just making them realize that we'll need everybody up in space is one of the ways to do that. But I'm happy to hear what other folks have to say. And your, your Spheres story and the last point you're making, I think, kind of uh, come together, too, because a, a kid doesn't have to go up to be a part of it. They can have an experiment up there. We have a number of, of speakers today that that help kids send experiments to space and be a part of all of this. And, and of course, they can connect with all of you, right? <laughs> 
Well, and, and all the educators that I know and all the people that I know who've gone on, on these trips come back and they want to use that to sort of create ripples and make a difference. And they don't want to be the only teacher that knows how to send something up to space. They share that with other teachers so that then there's other classes. And I really love that, that spirit that seems to exist in this community. Awesome. Well, Chewie or Ken? Yeah, space exploration is a very interesting fusion of science, technology, and human curiosity. Uh, it, it really has a unique ability to inspire uh, kids, adults, everyone, because you have not just this technical side, but you have this philosophical and personal connection with space. So it, it's, it's very unique. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, I saw a question fly by that kind of relates to this and what, what Katie just said too. Um, it's not just billionaires going to space. There, as of this morning, there've been 103 private individuals go to space. And it's, it's um, I looked at the statistics through August, uh, so it's almost up to date, but um, they're, they're quite, quite surprising. Uh, first of all, only about 55% of the people actually paid for their flight. Uh, about 19% of them are uh, people like Chewy, who work for a spaceflight company. Uh, there are nonprofits funding people's trips to space. Uh, and yeah, there are friends that are people, uh, people that are friends of very wealthy individuals going up. Um, there are lotteries. <laughs> there, there are a lot of ways to actually go to space right now. And as the price comes down, I mean, Starship has the capability of dropping the price significantly from where it is. It's already dropped by over a factor of 10. Starship can drop it much, much further. So uh, over the lifetime of kids in school today, it, it, it's just going to every, it's not, it's not a, um, Every year it's a little bit cheaper. They're going to be step functions, but it's going to be more and more within reach as time goes on for people. Um, no, I love it. And the idea that uh, Starship can also, never mind the moon and Mars, Starship can get you anywhere on the planet in 45 minutes. And they think for the price of a first class ticket, that's going to change a lot of people's access to space. Never mind, change a lot of industries. Yeah, I think Starship is. is a complete game changer the, the five year timeline with that is 10 year timelines is could be a very different landscape uh i know, I know I logan yeah you, you had your hand raised and frank i know you had a few thoughts um well maybe we should hear from chewy first though, in terms of the yeah sorry how might we prepare uh and then, yes, uh, and then we'll open it up yeah yeah i'll 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 be brief i think um other people already touched on it, but I think curiosity um, and uh, and having passion and creativity are super important. Um, I think every child has that. And I think the goal is to just make sure that doesn't get extinguished sometime between like the age of 12 and, and 21 um, and, and hold on to that thing. And I think now the industry is taking off so much that you can start to see different ways to participate a lot more than you could maybe 10, 20 years ago. And so I think there's hope uh, more be more hope than there's ever been to like not extinguish those childhood dreams and those uh, unfettered passions and curiosities. I think curiosity is, is huge. And I think where the industry is, hap is, is heading towards now is um, I think of space as an infrastructure technology and an infrastructure technology doesn't just do one thing. It enables everybody to do anything they can think of if they have the creativity and the passion and the curiosity. Um, the, the internet is like, is, you know, the most recent example of an infrastructure technology, or let's say Amazon is a good example, right? Amazon built up a bunch of servers so that they could sell a bunch of stuff um, uh, during the, the two month holiday, uh, holiday season. But then the other 10 months of the year, they've got these massive server racks that they actually use to host like 50% of the entire internet is hosted by AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services. And that's an infrastructure technology, right? Um, there's so many different ways we can use the internet to many different effects. Um, you know, 
Uh, Uber changed the landscape of what it is to use a mobile phone um, to do anything. You can, you know, book an Uber, you can book an Airbnb, these types of platform technologies. And so in terms of like seeing yourself in ministry, it's what do you, what do you care about? What are you passionate about? And then how, not if, but how can you use space to enhance it, make it better, make it faster, make it cheaper, make it more accessible? Um, we're doing so much research in space. And I guess, you know, shameless plug, uh, Virgin Galactic is, um, we send research payloads to space uh, through NASA contracts. Um, and so NASA has these programs, you can submit your payload uh, research applications, and then they'll put them on a space flight provider, whether it be at Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, or SpaceX. And um, we've been working with a company, an organization called IIAS, that also does uh, suborbital um, microgravity research, human tended research, another way to become an astronaut. We've got, um, when we fly the Delta class spaceship in a couple of years, we'll be sending, I think, three researchers up um, using, doing human tended research. And a lot of that research comes from NASA. And so like we're submitting, we're accepting applications or IIAS is accepting applications for research that you may want to do in space. And so you just look at what the space companies are doing and see what opportunities they're providing. Um, but research is a great way to get involved um, and Finding an excuse to come up with a research that requires a human um, is another way to uh, get to space. I love that. I think I think Chewie, you're the first person to say that on any of these panels to, that kids can get involved by doing research. Like, it, and there's there's a lot of opportunities for that. That's uh, that's a fantastic perspective. So we're we're going to open it up to participant questions at this point. Um, and one that, that caught our eye going by, uh, Shashi, do you maybe want to uh, come on, Mike, and ask your question of the panel, if you're still here? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, uh, but first of all, thanks for, for all this. this is amazing. Uh, I'm curious, what did you have to unlearn to become an astronaut? <laughs> yeah, and Katie, or anybody jump in uh, anytime, yeah. Um, I would say it, it is this idea of, of I, I was a chemist, so I was used to dealing with, you know, so there's a fire in my chemistry experiments, I'm going to know where the fire extinguisher is, and I'm going to do that. So I have kind of a little basis in it, but I used to kind of wonder, I know why we have pilot astronauts, but then these pilots that aren't pilot astronauts, but are, or navigators, you know, how come we have to have so many of them? Why can't we have more scientists and engineers? I really thought that, right? And and it, and what I didn't understand was that you know doing this stuff is is hard and it, it's hard on on all the platforms where you're getting training and it's about and there's a certain discipline and learning how to do something maybe the same way each time and then if it doesn't go right what the alternate way is and practicing it enough that it comes to mind when you're when you're you know worried scared all those things and so learning that like I'm I'm always I'm kind of like oh and we could do this I'm kind of a connector you know we could do that and what if we did this too and what if you know what if we added to that and at a certain point you have to you have to stop changing the plan because it just won't be safe enough everybody will have too much thing to think about you won't do it well um you'll take away from what's already planned and actually trained and and on solid ground and somewhere there's a you know, a, a spectrum, um, you know, at NASA where you're like, oh, really? Couldn't we really add stuff now? Aren't we just a year from flight? And that's when you kind of go, couldn't we? And how about like this? And, and you know, have those victories. But um, learning that it's at a certain point, you have to say, you know, what we've already got is, is what we're going to do. And that was surprising and painful to me to this day. You know, I was going to answer, I didn't have to unlearn anything, but then after listening to to Katie's answer I, I mean I experienced exactly that um I mean I'm an entrepreneur consider myself very innovative always trying to tr change and improve things but um between issues working with Blue Origin on on uh, having a personal camera while I was flying I ended up flying with a GoPro so there were issues there that related to process and procedure, just like Katie was talking about. But even after it was approved on my own end, um, I'm sitting there working through uh, trying different exposure modes, adjusting exposure, blah, 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 blah. Um, because taking these pictures of the Earth from space was one of my primary objectives. I wanted to make sure I, I got good photographs. 
But as I, as I drilled and practiced on the fact that I had less than two minutes to do all this, um, even after kind of accepting all the bureaucratic limits on what I was able to take, a very simple camera was all that was allowed, um, I found that I, I was simplifying the thing myself. Um, and in the end, uh, I realized that the last thing I wanted to be doing up there was adjusting exposure, fiddling around, perhaps getting the camera in a mode that I didn't want it in and having no time to recover or fix it. And I ended up putting the camera in 5K video mode and that was it. You know, if the exposures were good, they were good. And if they weren't, they weren't. And uh, it ended up working working well, but it's it's not how I would normally approach the problem. Huh. Yeah, it's simply because point. of the time constraints. The thing about flying to space is uh, it is rocket science, and you're trying to make uh, you're trying to control as much as you know you can control, and then margin or plan for the things you can't control. And so when there's more you introduce new variables at a time frame that doesn't allow you to take them from uncontrolled to controlled, you present risk into the system. And risk is something, although it sounds seems like launching to space is really risky, it's probably the one thing humans have ever invented that have spent the most brain cells trying to monitor, mitigate, and control risk uh, because it is everywhere. And so I think the thing that I had to unlearn, um, my background is aerospace engineering. I worked at Virgin Galactic. I, I helped design the space craft that I flew on. Um, in this particular, my job is to figure out how strong to build the spaceship. So I'm part of the structural design organization. So I, I have an acute awareness of all of the different failure modes and um, the choices we made and, and the risk uh, that we tried to mitigate and, and control. And so for me, I had to unlearn my, uh, my typical process of how to trust. Because uh, in engineering um, and in science, you're trying to control as much as you can and that requires you to try and know as much as you can. But at a certain point, every every any space launch system is beyond the comprehension of any one person in terms of complexity. And so that means you have to figure out how you're going to come up with a new mechanism of trust that's beyond you trying to know everything. And so that's, um, do I trust the people? Do I like these people? Are these people good? Um, do I have a good framework for how to trust people? Judge of character? Do they have a good track record? Um, did they do testing? Do they have evidence? Is there experiment or the risk? So like, I think I had to unlearn my engineering way to trust because that was never going to lead me to a point of I'm comfortable accepting this risk. Um, I had to come up with a new mechanism of trust. Um, it's like I know a lot about the spaceship, Virgin Galactic spaceship, but I know nothing about like the propulsion system. I didn't work on that at all. And, uh, you know, sitting in between two giant pressure vessels is a little bit unnerving. And, <laughs> um, but I became comfortable with that risk because I learned more about it. But, and I trusted the people. Um, and I probably had the unique experience of working with these people for, you know, half of a decade and knowing their competence and their skills and the testing that we've done. Um, but other people are going to have to come up with a different level of trust to do something like this. Uh, and that's kind of what we're trying to do as an industry is bolster up everyone else's trust in the industry. Because uh, it doesn't take much, like even was it last year or two years ago when the submarine um, had the submarine incident, like that was like a sent shockwaves to the commercial space industry. And that's not even anything like submarines are totally different than spacecraft. <clears throat> not totally different, but like high pressure and low pressure, kind of different in terms of design and, and mitigation. Well, it's interesting. All of your your answers sort of point to the same idea of there, there comes a point where you can no longer add complexity and you do have to trust and uh, and accept some degree of risk to move forward. And it sounds like an important life lesson to me. Uh, we are almost out of time, but Logan has had his hand up for a long period. So Logan, if you want to come on mic real quick and and uh, and share your question. Um, and and uh, I think we'll probably have to wrap up at that point. I need a couple minutes at the end just to share resources and send people off to the first sessions. But Logan, if you're still there. Yep. Um I'm a past collector, curator, space historian, and storyteller. And one of my, um, I think one of one of the gifts that I give is mission patches to educators to put into the hands of students. And I use storytelling of the the origin story of their design to to spark curiosity, but more importantly, to build a bridge between the story of the design and the STEM that's related to the mission. 
And in particular, uh, Katie, I, uh, STS 73 and 93 are two patches that I, that are part of the, the classroom set that I give to educators. And I've, I've donated about 36,000 patches to 850 educators in 24 countries. And so I, to the extent that I can, I use stories like stories from Nicole Stoat and Charlie Walker and Mike Mullane to tell a personal story about how you influenced or personal insights into your mission patches that I share with, with, uh, with students to spark that interest. Um, and then that leads to a segue from Chewy that leads to STEM research related to the payloads, which is where, you know, which is where this all goes and, and getting the, the patches into the hands of students is a transformative learning experience. So Katie, if you would be so kind, could you share with us, uh, either STS 73 or STS 93? And by the way, I, I've, I've spoke to Mark Pastana, who's the designer for STS 93. So I have his perspective, uh, but I will say personally, I'm very intrigued by the STS 73 patch, uh, but it's your choice. I know. Yeah, exactly. I love the chemistry. I love, you know, I'm a, I'm a geologist, uh, you know, through academic training. So Katie's wearing her STS 73 mission patch. You, you choose, can you pick one of the two, those two missions and just share with us kind of your origin story and influence over its design and any kind of backstory you're, you're willing to share uh, about one of those mission patches? Well, first, I think they're so important. I think mission patches, and that doesn't mean just astronaut mission patches, but um, like our mission on our space station mission, we actually, as we left the station, we took um, photographs, Paolo Nespoli did from Italy, um, to, as we undocked in the Soyuz, took photographs of the shuttle and the station docked together because we've never had those those photographs. And it's and it's like a the symbol of what we accomplished yeah. together as so many nations. And and it's see, you see it on magazine cover, you see it all these places because it just symbolizes. And I think that being part of a team and especially like a classroom group where you're not going to get everybody's name on the patch or something, but it's still it's it, they're very unifying and reminding. And I'm a sort of visual and I mean yeah. I my my husband's a glass artist and I we actually met um, after, I mean, he did space art long before we ever met, but I had, I wanted to go out and buy a planet when I wanted to be an astronaut that would, would remind me that I should just keep trying to, to do this. And, um, so with that, I'll tell you the one person who was not involved in my patches was my husband, the artist. He's like, oh, I am way too smart to get in the middle of this. And everyone that designs patches, I mean, basically they're, you know, designed by committee, which means they can be awful. Right. And these yeah. poor artist people are trying to make something reasonable. I think all the artists should be nominated as like UN uh, facilitators. OK, but on this one, we actually all stayed friends and all those kinds of things. Um, I like this because it, if you can look close enough, I'll sort of scooch this closer here. Not very flattering, but, you know, whoops. Um, but we were SJ 73 was the uh, second iteration of the uh, United States microgravity mission. It was literally a precursor to the space station. I mean, the questions that were on deck were, how are we going to build a space station that allows scientists to be scientists and do experiments and what's going to work, what's not going to work. And so we had about 30 different experiments, a big laboratory in the back of the payload bay of the shuttle. It's kind of like being in the back of the dump truck. And on it, if you look closely, you see these lines in purple that represents the cupola on the space station. So kind of making sure we rem remember what our big purpose is. Um, we wanted to have scientific symbols. There was ones because we grew crystals and then the fluid physicists felt very left out. There was discussions. There was, I don't want to say there were tears, but there kind of were. Um, anyways, so the infinity symbol is used in a lot of fluid physics equations. And and this um, and the shape of the patch itself is like a so soccer ball, which represents the universe. Um, and in a star for everybody that was um, on the mission, um, plus uh, I think also people that had passed um, as well. So the unify, and it's purple because the mission commander, Ken Bowersox, wanted it to be purple. An astronaut mm -hmm. god likes purple. So there we were. So that is the story of that, but uh, I do treasure them. And and just real quick about uh, SDS 93 is that we were deploying the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Keep your eyes on that as educators because their website is amazing, chandra.harvard.edu. Uh, 
um, EDU, I believe, but just look up Chandra telescope. Everything you know about black holes literally comes from that telescope. Um, it's on the chopping block, I think personally, because there hasn't been very great um, information um, that's been out, allowed to be out there. It was sort of unfairly like, oh, it's old, it's this, it's that. Um, of course, you always have your favorite telescope, but um, keep an eye on the news, speak your mind. But as educators, go to their website because they really have so many creative interdisciplinary ways to talk about space and missions. And I mean, they have audible, they, they've made sonifications of, of spectra, things like that. But it's also famous because Eileen Collins was the first woman commander. I just saw the documentary just premiered this weekend about her life. And all of us can learn a lot of things from Eileen um, from that documentary. So that's my long-winded um, way to make us over time, which is my way. Well, SDS-93 Mark's children actually had an influence in its, in the design of that mission patch. I forgot. So I will, I will just Terrible. leave it at that. <laughs> so ki well, so ki kids can be involved. And that's, you know, if for, if for you personally, it, it, it definitely oh, influenced the, the outcome of that mission patch. A kid named the telescope. I believe. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, on account of the time, we're going to have to wrap up here. And I, I do need a couple minutes to share some resources and send people to the first session. But uh, real briefly, Ken or Chewy, if you have any uh, parting comments for the uh, the educators and enthusiasts in attendance, uh, I want to give you a moment to do that. Oh, uh, way to put on the spot. Um, no. Just follow your dreams. Uh, dream bigger than you think you can. And, uh, and enjoy the journey. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing about trying to achieve something audacious is enjoying the journey. Uh, just in case you don't make it or you don't make it as fast as you want, it's important to enjoy the struggle because the struggle is life. And if it might, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, if you take the traditional NASA astronaut route, it can take 10, 20, 30 years to, to fly to space. It's probably going to change now with a lot more options uh, to actually launch, but uh, it's a long journey to to do anything worth doing sometimes. And uh, so you have to enjoy the struggle. Awesome. I appreciate that. And I hope everybody will stick around too. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Hey, Mark, uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm yes. going to try with one last thing. I know Frank Please. Probably would want to say this, but one thing that, that Frank has said before is that we're, we're all in space right now. <laughs> and it's like, it's uh it's 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 a great idea you know it's we're you know we're on this on this spaceship Earth and it's carrying us through space but uh, you know we just don't realize it. so it's great to have all this these ideas to to help us you know keep that uh, front of mind. All right. Well, I want to say, and it's it's a good point. We're hopefully we're all crew and not just passengers here on Spaceship Earth. Uh, so thank you again to uh, to our panelists, uh, Dr. Katie Coleman and Ken Hess and Chris Huey. Thank you to all three of you for coming. Uh, I feel like it's such a privilege uh, for the for Ron and Gitika and I to get to to hear all of you and to have you here today. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and and uh, and thank you to everybody else who uh, who has joined us as well. I want to make sure that everybody who came to this opening session has access to a few resources. Uh, and then also invite you guys to stick around for the breakout sessions we have all day. Uh, and then this afternoon, uh, Frank White and uh, Felix Gatfield. So in terms of those resources, you can all join the uh, Facebook group that we launched uh, after uh, this event at a, at a previous iteration. Uh, uh, you can probably get redirected there going to spaceeducator.net. Uh, but I will also drop the uh, direct Facebook link in the chat right now so you guys can join the Facebook group. Um, I try to share resources there regularly. And um, there's a few other members who are kind of prolific, but encourage you guys to uh, to share there as well. Uh, also, uh, I had the privilege to work with the Space Prize Foundation a couple of years ago and released a uh, complete curriculum meant for high school kids. Uh, at the time, we were uh, working to empower young women to be more involved uh, with the uh, aerospace industry. Uh, but I think this curriculum will work for any kid that's motivated and has the, the reading ability. So uh, it's not just an introduction to uh, space science and the history of space exploration, which you can get a lot of places. It's also why space is important to people on Earth uh, and what sorts of skill sets and mindsets uh, might be important to students uh, for humanity's future in space. Uh, it gets into the new space economy and then uh, sort of space philosophy issues of uh, sustainability and ethics and governance, things like that. 
Um, so spaceeducation.org should redirect you there and you can find it on CK12, which is an open education uh, resource. Uh, also, I, of course, have to mention uh, my book and Anahita's book. Uh, my book is focused on, uh, it's really for educators, but it's a series of academic studies uh, looking at that question of how might we best prepare students for the growing space economy and humanity's future in space. And Anahita and Frank co-authored a book, Introducing the Overview Effect to Children Through Story. So Star Sailor, The Overview Effect Chronicles is a really great book to help bring these ideas to, uh, to younger students. Also, if you want to go in more depth, certainly stick around for the day. But I also run a uh, uh, online professional development uh, course for teachers. We're kicking off again in January. It's 12 weekly uh, meetings on Zoom, just like this. Uh, it's a graduate student or a class format. There's a CEU available. So if you want to join us, it's arieslearning.com slash course. It's after school on the West Coast, after dinner, uh, perhaps on the East Coast. But I'm also running one uh, starting in February. Uh, for folks who are in the EU and Africa. So much earlier in the day, if you'd like to join us. So it's arieslearning.com slash course or slash EU for the EU and Africa cohorts. And then uh, some of you who are here have participated in this, but for those of you that aren't aware of it, uh, I also work with Dr. Kirby Runyon, who's a planetary scientist who's uh, worked on the New Horizons mission and he's mapped the moon and Mars for scientific purposes. Uh, to take teachers uh, and others out into the desert. We spend a day at Spaceport America, actually visiting Virgin Galactic and uh, seeing uh, the Spaceship Unity and so forth. And then we spend two days out in the desert visiting landforms similar to what you might find on the moon or Mars or elsewhere. So we're talking lava fields and sand dunes and craters. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of uh, tour the solar system without leaving Earth and bring that experience uh, back home to your students or your community. So uh, for today, you can find the schedule at spaceeducation.events slash schedule, or again, the, uh, the full link, if you have trouble with the redirect, is spaceeducation.squarespace.com, and you can find the schedule there. Uh, we have breakout sessions for the rest of the day, four, uh, four topics per session, and Ron is, uh, is about to open the breakout room so the speakers can get set up and you guys can join us. And uh, kicking us off, we have, uh, speaking of the EU and Africa, we have folks who are uh, quite a bit east of Ron and I here in California. So you can see uh, Paul Prouse uh, talking about the world's biggest analog, uh, Mindy Howard closing the dream gap for girls, uh, Motasham Saqib talking about navigating space for young people, and uh, Paul Cox talking about SLU's cosmic classroom, giving students access to uh, remote telescopes around the world. 